हरे कृष्णा कृष्ण क्षेत्र महाराज थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर जॉइनिंग यूर टुडे इट्स माई प्लेजर टू बी विद यू अगेन I got a lot of positive feedback from devotees about our last podcast, especially oh. the point that you know faith doesn't have to require the elimination of doubt, but they can have been a constant dialogue. In fact, I gave that yes. title itself to the podcast, but that was a illuminating point. Many devotees said that we had never heard of it, and <laughs> before, that was brilliant. Well, I'm I'm waiting for when when do I get in trouble for that? <laughs> 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 hopefully i think uh, uh, maybe we have as a movement graduated past that stage where maybe 10 15 years ago this would have yeah. been a scandalous statement but now Big i trouble, think yeah. <laughs> as a movement we have we recognized the somewhat broader horizons yeah i hope so <laughs> yes well i thank you so when i today i was thinking of discussing on the topic of uh, using our imagination in krishna service yeah. you know mm-hmm. i got this inspiration from two ways one was no i'll tell both and then i can we can move forward in my childhood mm-hmm. i had read a ramayan and i had liked it very much and then recently i revisited it and i wrote the author, read the author's preface and there the author writes now the author is known to be not a not a iskon devotee but a krishna bhakta so about mm-hmm. vishnu bhakta so he had written that in this book with all the devotion of my heart i offer to krish offer to ram uh, all the imagination he has given me hmm so that was a very striking usage for me that normally we think of imagination as something you know we don't we want ima- don't want imaginary things but is right. using the imagination service that was a very striking phrase and then i also remember that you have authored or encouraged devotees to write for a series of smaranam books where yes. there is some amount of visualization of krishna's past time especially those past time that speak to us yes. so then i thought these are two backgrounds to stimuli for having this discussion yes yes much so maybe you can speak on this topic and especially how you felt inspired to do this smaranam book series of books okay Uh yeah let's let's start with how how these books started and um I might as well sort of show one of them this was uh the first volume that we did some years back uh, it's called Krishna Smarana uh Krishna Smarana and then subtitle is Devotee's Creative Monologues elaborating krishna's pastimes mm. this is available by the way on uh, amazon kindle okay <laughs> for free it uh, can oh. be downloaded if you just search krishna smarana you'll find this one and we did three all together uh, krishna smarana rama smarana and gora smarana yeah and i'll explain later what we're working on now the ram smarna just now i checked it's not available online uh but this krishna smarna and gora smarna are both available on kindle so yeah this was back in which year was it uh 2010 uh we had this summer camp retreat in serbia uh mm-hmm. in southeast europe and i was um, we were discussing different pastimes of krishna after killing kamsa mm-hmm. and i was thinking how to engage the devotees in really thinking more deeply about the pastimes and i was encouraging devotees to write uh a sort of monologue and i suggested uh take some minor c- character you know someone who is perhaps on the sidelines who somehow or other is observing and what would they see what would they experience what would they think and so on 
So the devotees, they all kind of stared at me with blank looks. <laughs> you know, what are you talking about? <laughs> and I thought, okay, there's no use in just asking them to do something. I need to show an example. <laughs> mm. So that, that same evening, uh, I, in my room, I had an idea and I put it on computer. Um, I was thinking about the story of uh, Krishna's wedding with Rukmini and how, uh, the, how Rukmini Devi sends this Brahmin uh, to, uh, with a message to Krishna. And I thought, okay, here we have something. The Brahmin. I don't think we get a name of this Brahmin mm -hmm. in the uh, Bhagavatam. Um, he's journeying by himself to see Krishna. Presumably, he's never met Krishna before. What is he thinking on his way to meeting Krishna? Mm -hmm. So I... I imagined, you know, what would one think <laughs> in anticipation of uh, going to Dwaraka and seeing Krishna? And I made as a, a kind of, how to say, a formal uh, restriction for myself. Every sentence in this little piece, which is just a couple of pages, or I don't remember, less maybe, uh, every sentence is in the form of a question. Um, and so he's kind of asking questions of himself and he's anticipating. Uh, and so, um, so then I brought that the next day to the seminar. I read it out and then devotees were, oh, okay, yeah, I kind of get it now. I could do maybe something like this. <laughs> so questions means, is he asking, okay, how will Krishna receive me? What will Krishna look like? What will Krishna's yeah. palace look like? Something like that? Yeah, things like that. But also, I, it's been a while since I've yeah. looked at it myself. But also, um, maybe reflections on himself. Who am I to be qualified to, to go see Krishna and so on? Um, yeah. But that's just, you know, that was just my particular idea for this particular writing. Uh, it's by no means anything like now we should all write everything in form of questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so that was the first inspiration. Uh, and um, then I made some uh, specifications. I think I said, uh, please, uh, you know, don't write more than X number of words. We don't want it to be too long. And uh, most of those who are who participated in these, English is not uh, their first language. And so uh, we did some English editing at the same time in my introduction. I say, please don't mind. Sometimes the English may be a bit awkward. So the idea was just to get, get devotees, well, you know, First of all, get to what he's reading, because I, I, I strongly feel there's, there's a difference between active reading and passive reading, uh, where active reading means you're, you're looking for something and you're, you're reading with the idea of one way or another passing on what you read. Uh, there's Shravanam and then there's Kirtanam. So as we read, if we think about what it is we read in terms of how would I communicate this to someone else, immediately becomes active, it becomes, uh, becomes interesting. <laughs> but as far as imagination goes, I want to read, I put this in the introduction to this uh, first book, a quote from Srila Prabhupada. This was in a lecture on uh, June 1st, 1974, in Geneva, on Srimad Bhagavatam 1.13.10. Um, Prabhupada said, 
you can imagine that, quote, in my heart, I have placed now a very diamond throne and Krishna is sitting, unquote. That is accepted. It is, actually, it becomes. Even within the mind, you think that, quote, I have kept one diamond throne, very costly throne, because Krishna is coming. He will sit down here, unquote. That is not false. That is a fact. So you create some situation within your heart. Quote, now Krishna has seated. Let me wash his feet with the Ganges water, Yamuna water. So, of course, Prabhupada here is describing a very standard aspect of archana called manasa puja or manasika puja. Uh, and it's a standard uh, step in the full practice of archana that you, you first meditate on offering uh, the upacharas, the different items. And uh, I've always found this uh, potentially, I've always found it a, a wonderful aspect of archana because in one sense, there's, there's no limit to uh, what you can bring to Krishna in that meditation. We always have a problem in uh, Western northern countries, uh, lack of flowers, or even if we have flowers, they hardly ever smell, and mm. flowers are very expensive. But uh, with Manasa Puja, you can offer heaps and heaps of you know, wonderful, uh, fragrant flowers like you have there in India most of the year. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's, and, and of course, you can uh, offer a whole feast, you know, chapa and boga, and you can, you can make a, a procession with elephant. I mean, there's, you know, there's no limit. You can, uh, it, it can be quite some fun, actually. So the point I want to make here is just um, Prabhupada is suggesting, he uses the word imagine. Mm. And then he says, uh, imagine what? Imagine a, a diamond throne in your heart. And then he says, it is not false. <laughs> it becomes, Prabhupada says, yeah, that's, that's true. I can, yeah. <laughs> it is not false. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, wow. and and so so that led me, that led me to think cuz i'm a little bit anticipating uh maybe one question that uh, may come up is um you know sort of where do you draw the line but also when we read some uh things that our acharyas have written um yes. when we when we read um shila jiva goswami's Maharaj, just example. one minute. You know, just about this quote, if you don't mind. You know, we can go to that a little later. So, okay. with respect to Manas Puja, uh, there are certain things which are, say, traditional and it's understood. Say, like, we would like to decorate Krishna on a, with beautiful jewels or ornaments or place him on a wonderful throne. So, that is something yes. which we would like to do in real life. And if we can't do it in real life, at least do it in the heart. Hmm? So yes. we have precedents for that. Say, for example, when I think Vasudev couldn't give charity on the birth of Krishna. At that time, uh -huh. he gave charity mentally. And later on, he gave yes. practically. So yes. that is, in one sense, imagining what we would like to do for Krishna. Uh, so yeah. now, different from that is maybe imagining what Krishna is doing. Or imagining mm. what uh, or how things were when, when, when Krishna was performing a particular pastime. So yeah. the, fir the first has many precedents, but the second is what I think you are going towards. But I've just thought of just clarifying the yeah. difference between the two. Because one, I don't okay. think it will be ever controversial. But the second mm. is where 
some issues might come up where we are can we actually not imagine maybe imagine is a slightly provocative word visualize what uh, yeah. what krishna is doing so yeah. you are saying something about some of our acharyas past times you can continue that yeah so one thing that comes in uh, to the subject of course is the idea of adhikar uh, who who has qualification uh, we may say who has qualification to imagine <laughs> And uh, we may look, I mentioned Jiva Goswami, um, Sanatan Goswami in, with his Brihad Bhagavatamrita. And we look at this and we say, okay, these are our very exalted acharyas. They are uh, eternal associates of the Lord. And so what they're describing is not something they're just imagining. It's something they're visualizing. It's something they see. It's, it's like uh, we... We get the idea, you know, maybe they are uh, getting transcendental television reception like Sanjaya uh, from the battlefield of Kurukshetra, something like that. Yes, that may be the case. Or, um, and I'm just, I'm thinking aloud here a little bit. I was reflecting on this this morning that um, in advanced spiritual life, the advanced devotees, Krishna is reciprocating with the desire of the devotee. Uh, and, and what this suggests to me is we, we may be able to go a step further with the idea of an acharya's imagination is such that it becomes reality. And this uh, goes back to what Prabhupada is saying, imagine a diamond throne. It is not false. Um, <laughs> it, is, uh, it becomes a reality. Mm -hmm. And then the, 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 fa the famous example Prabhupada uh, so much liked to tell, which is referred to in Bhakti Rasamrita, Sindhu, Nectar yeah. of Devotion, uh, of uh, the devotee who's doing this manasa puja, he's testing the sweet rice uh, to see if it's cooled down. It's not cooled down. He burns his finger, and indeed, his finger is actually burnt. <laughs> uh, so there's this crossover between imagination and reality that seems to happen when. Uh, there's very high adhikar, and Krishna wants that to happen. Once uh, allows allows it to happen by, yeah, by the will of the devotee. So we often say, "Oh, that's just imagination." But at some point in uh, devotional life, uh, it's not just imagination. <laughs> it's something more than that. So, so just. To clarify this, when you are saying that the two distinct explanations you gave, one is that something is already happening and a devotee, visual, devotee basically sees it, like tunes into, a, uh, tunes into a radio or a television. And the other yeah. is when a devotee is imagining, then Krishna makes it happen. Krishna makes it a reality. Is that the yeah. two things you are saying? So Yes. So, yeah, so in the second thing, and Krishna makes it a reality, uh, are you saying that Krishna performs that pastime, say, in the devotee's heart, or actually Krishna manifests all those details in a particular universe where he's, uh, he's doing those Who things? Knows? Who knows? Okay. <laughs> See, this, this gets to uh, a point which in the academic study of religion comes up that there are basically two major camps uh, of theorizing about uh, religion, what it is. Uh, one we may call the receptionist uh, understanding, and the other is the projectionist understanding. Okay. Uh, the receptionists say there is some transcendent reality um, and that transcendent reality is 
being communicated to human beings, to certain human beings, uh, special being humans, whatever. But it is something out there or okay. someone, and that's being received. And mm -hmm. then uh, the other camp says, no, 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 you're, you're, you're too religious. <laughs> What's really happening is that people uh, with fertile, fertile imaginations are projecting what's going on in the, just in their heads out into the world. And that becomes religion. What it seems to me, Vaishnavism, what we understand is there is very much a transcendent reality mm -hmm. which is being received and it's also as it's being received it's awakening in the heart and then the heart is being activated and that leads to yes a certain projection becomes the wrong word but it's something like projection but what it is, is uh, it's kirtan, it's glorification. Mm. And that glorification is um, expanding the glories, right? Because the, the Lord is unlimited, his pastimes are unlimited, and they are happening as we speak. And part of how they're happening is that we participate in them. Uh, I always remember uh, His Holiness Lokanath Swami in, in a Bhagavatam lecture talking about how uh, we practice uh, hearing and picturing uh, Krishna's pastimes. And in the course of practice, as we become more and more practiced, at one point, he put it this way, he said, at one point, you may notice a gap in the pastime in which you belong. That's where you fit. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> and, and that's when you enter into the pastime. <laughs> okay. That's striking. So uh, just going back to this receptionist and projectionist. Yeah. So I thought that uh, the general academic study of religion is, is, is usually more skeptical, but still within that also there are these two ideas. I thought most of the times it is people think that there is nothing transcendental and it is more of a sociological or psychological kind of phenomena which we analyze. Um, well, there, I would say there are two major uh, sorts of, of scholars of religion, but this is also overgeneralizing. Um, but um, there are scholars who tend to be reductionists. They want to say uh, this is uh, nothing more than uh, a phenomenon which can be understood through uh, sociology, psychology, um, politics, economics, and so on. And there are those who say, all those things are there, and we can study them, that's fine, and we can see how they may indeed have influence on uh, people uh, doing what we may call religious practice, and there's something more. And that something more is something which uh, you can never reduce. Uh, one, one scholar from pre the previous generation at Harvard, uh, Wilfred Cantwell Smith, made this point. There's, there's two things. He said there's what he called cumulative tradition, which is all the things that are visible, maybe measurable, which are... Um, phenomenon that scholars can look at. And there is uh, 
there is the reality, he insisted, this is a reality, which is the faith uh, of, of people, the, the faith in the heart. And he said, that's something that we as scholars will never access. We can, we can listen to what they say about their faith, and we can listen, uh, we can yeah. read their writings, et cetera, et cetera. We can hear their singing, um, analyze their architecture and their painting, and on and on. Uh, but you can never get to that thing in itself, that faith. Therefore, he wanted to insist that uh, religion is something to take seriously. Um, as a human phenomenon, he says, we, we don't have to argue about whether or not what is being believed in exists or not. That's not our business as scholars of religion. That's for theologians to discuss. Uh, so academic study of religion, of course, <laughs> Bhakti Siddhanta Thakur would call this uh, probably, you know, licking, uh, trying to lick the honey from the outside of yeah. the bottle. Uh, but it's um, it's a sophisticated field. It, it's it's um, you know, there's a lot of um, engaging uh, discussion, which I think can also be enriching for devotees, some devotees, to engage with, to reflect on. Yes, Maharaj. That's another subject. Yeah, of <laughs> course. Yeah, but thank you for so. You mentioned about this, we can't know faith. I think I read in Tamal Krishna Maharaj, one of his books that he says, there's a difference between knowing God and knowing about God. Yeah. So, something similar to knowing about the expressions of the faith and knowing that or experiencing that faith itself. Yeah. So yeah. now... And there are scholars of religion. There are, there are highly religious scholars of religion. Uh, and uh, they will, um, they can function in both worlds, so to say. Mm. Yeah. I think you are a vibrant example of that yourself, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, going, going back to our point that, so you were mentioning that in our tradition, we could say it's a combination of both uh, both, uh, or what was it? Uh, not projection, that was reception. reception. And then maybe yeah. you could say glorification or expression, not projection. But right. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So then, yeah. now, just going back to those, that example of Gopal Champu, you know, I was thinking of, say, three levels of description of Krishna Leela or the Lord's pastimes. One is, say, we have the Bhagavatam, which is we understand Shukadeva Goswami at least at some level describing what has happened in the tenth canto. Then we have yeah. Gopal Champu, or some of Gopal Champu especially we could consider. And then we have some of the things which are explicitly written with the name Natakas, dramas. We have say yes. Chaitanya Chandrodha Natak or some uh, I think some uh, dramas. So now that are the dramas are also considered to be say of the first level or second level, or are they considered to be dramas to be enacted? What has been the attitude of the tradition toward these? Oh, that, that in itself becomes a huge topic because, uh, as we know, uh, Srila Rupa Goswami in particular, and then uh, also uh, uh, Kavi Kaharnapura, yes. um, were both writing dramas. You mentioned the one from Kavi Karnapura, Chaitanya yeah. Chandra Dai Nataka. Um, and they are writing these dramas within um, a very rich tradition of theorizing on the nature of uh, poetry and drama, of Sanskrit poetry and drama, which goes back to uh, uh, the uh, the work of Bharat, uh, the uh, Bharat, Natya Shastra, uh, Natya Shastra yeah. yeah, and and then 
out of that, there, there are branches and sub-branches of theorizing and, uh, and arguing back and forth. <laughs> and then we come to uh, Rupa Goswami, who then uh, transcendentalizes the whole discussion um, by saying that the essence or the, the core the core of rasa is bhakti, bhakti rasa. And Kavi Karnapura uh, agrees with this. They didn't, they didn't uh, collaborate. They were in different parts of India. Um, but they, they're both saying the same thing. And they both wrote uh, short manuals. I was trying to remember the name of the manuals. Uh, on poetics, on, on the rules of Sanskrit poetics, as Nata they Chandrika, understand them. Rupa Goswami is Natak Chandrika, I think. Hari Parshat yes, that's it. Yeah, yeah Natak Chandrika. And um, I think it's Tamal Krishna Goswami who explains uh, that in Natak Chandrika, Rupa Goswami says that for the purpose of establishing rasa, for bringing out, for uh, highlighting a particular rasa in a particular narrative, it is permissible to make some changes from uh, the Shastric source, whether it's Bhagavatam or Mahabharata or whatever. And Kavi Karnapura does this in a very interesting way. I've just been reading uh, this wonderful, elaborate uh, analysis of Kavi Karnapura. Um, I have his book here somewhere I can show uh, from uh, Gopinata Charya Prabhu. Yeah. yeah. And he says, he explains toward the end of his book that. Kavikarnapura does something interesting with uh, the Bhagavatam's description of Rasa Lila in order to highlight uh, the uh, Shimati Radharani's feelings of compassion. <laughs> and I, I won't go into the details, but uh, he, he makes a definite shift in the story in order to bring this out. And someone might say, oh, how dare he? <laughs> well, <laughs> um, he's Kavi Karnapura, and furthermore, he's doing what is uh, allowed in the tradition for the purpose that he's doing it, which is highlighting this rasa, in this case of compassion, to go with Madhurya. Um, so, in terms of these three categories you mentioned, that's, that's not in his drama, that's in his champu, the Ananda Vrindavan champu. Okay. So, um, yes, there's these three genres you mentioned, but um, whether, you, whether you can make the same distinctions of degree of reality or something to fit each of those i don't know if that'll work oh yes i think in the anandan champu when i read it also it struck me that he analyzes radharani's uh, radharani asks krishna to stop because he says she's concerned about the other gopis and yes is that what you're referring to about her yes Radharani? Yeah, so yeah, basically so, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. So that is not mentioned in the Bhagavatam specifically at all. But right. Yeah. So that's, I found it a very inspiring uh, point. And when we speak it also, it, it makes that transcendental pastime so accessible and relishable at our level also. That even yeah. while being with Krishna, Radharani is concerned about other gopis, <laughs> not just exactly. about Krishna herself. Yeah. Yes. That's it. So, so he's saying, what, what is Gopinath Charipur saying that this is what Rupa Gos, what uh, Kavikarnapur has, has done a distinctive shift in emphasis. 
Is that? Yeah, he, he highlights, he highlights that, yeah. Now, I think another, um, another aspect of this we can uh, reflect on uh, is from Chaitanya Charitamrita. Uh, as we know, uh, poets would write poetry inspired by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and they would bring it, they wanted to recite it uh, to Lord Chaitanya, but they had to go through uh, Saurabh Damodar. Yes. And he, he was the gatekeeper. Mm. And there's at least one story where he, he throws out you know, one applicant <laughs> because <Yeah. laughs> because he gets the rasa wrong. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, just a minute, Maharaj. Yeah. Is that uh, rasa wrong or it's almost the siddhanta wrong? Because I think yeah, he got the siddhanta wrong. Because he has, like, and with that, of course, the rasa with that he probably got the rasa wrong too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, so there's a couple of things here. One is. And this comes from some, forget the name, but one uh, respected historian of Bengal, of the uh, historian of Bengali literature, who points out that there was a huge explosion uh, of literary activity uh, with uh, the advent of. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu with his movement. There's there's almost a major, you know, beginning point of a of a major uh, type of activity in Bengal of uh, literary activity in Bengal, inspired by Lord Chaitanya and his associates, suggesting to me that uh, it's integral, specifically to our tradition. Uh, that there be uh, literary activity and creative literary activity. Which uh, activity this scholar mentioned? Means which literary activity ex arose because of Lord yeah, The writing of songs, the writing of poetry, the writings of drama. Oh, okay. In Bengali language. Okay. That's interesting. When Chaitanya Charitamrita also. One of the qualities of Vaishnava is mentioned as a Kavi. Kavi, that's also in Bhagavatam. So, and the other point is that um, <clears throat> that Sarup Damodar represents, he sort of embodies the uh, a tradition which we see in modern secular culture, and that is of the review process. Mm. Now, in the academic world, if you want to get a, um, an article published in an academic journal, it goes through what's called peer review. Uh, there will be one or two anonymous scholars who are qualified in the field and so on. So that's a, a, a sort of self-regulating system. In, in, the, um, in the general sphere of publishing, uh, you have book reviews, which are published in magazines and newspapers. And, you know, there's the uh, New York Times Review of Books. There's the London uh, Times, I guess, Review of Books. And people take those reviews very seriously and decide whether or not they're going to buy this or that book based on those reviews. And the review can be anything. It can be pra praising a book like anything, or it can be, you know, completely yeah. smashing the book. Yeah. Um, that's the system. So there's, there's a culture there which I think would also be... Uh, of value within the society of Vaishnavas. What I mean by that, years ago, quite some decades ago, there was concern um, in the GBC 
that um, devotees are writing books and they're publishing them themselves and, you know, all kinds of things are getting out there. This should all be controlled. And so they set up a review system. But it, it failed miserably because it was way too slow. It just became a bottleneck. Mm. And in the end, um, devotees said, hey, I don't care whether I'm approved by the GBC or not. <laughs> I'm going to publish my book. <laughs> So that was, you know, very quickly abandoned, that whole concept. Uh, but, mm, and now what we have is, uh, in a sense, completely unregulated, um, by which I mean we don't have any self-regulation, which is unfortunate. In one sense, it's unfortunate because what, uh, re what the reviewing culture provides it educates readers to be more discriminating mm. of what is good writing uh what's good um yeah what is good writing what's good publishing and it educates authors uh to be more self-critical mm. so that we get more uh more quality of publications which then in turn will be taken more seriously uh, by a wider public. That's true. Mm -hmm. That's, it's tough. You know, at, uh, time, one time when I was asked to be a part of a review for some books and it becomes not just time consuming from us to read, but you have to yeah. actually communicate with that person. And often if that person is much more senior to us, then how yeah, they will yeah. take it. It's very difficult. Yeah. Yeah, in, I think in the Catholic tradition, they had something called an imprimator. That this book doesn't contain any objectionable theology. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what the GBC was trying to do, but that fell flat. So, um, and I don't think that's what we want. Yeah, it's tough. I think we, I think we want uh, more, more of an open culture. Um, we want to encourage, Prabhupada encouraged, actually Prabhupada more than once said, all my, all my students, all my, all the devotees should write. Yes. <laughs> so of course, writing is just one, one sort of creativity. It's, yeah. it's, it's one that I'm trying to encourage. Um, we see a lot of music creativity, a lot of uh, uh, graphic arts creativity yes, and uh, what else even architectural yeah. depiction also a lot of creativity yeah. in that yes. yeah Somehow I think personally I think there could also be more more creativity in uh, clothing design for deities um, that could be controversial but i think there could be some very much more uh i mean there's nice wonderful clothes but i think there could be uh, more interesting things done as well and we have clothes designers amongst devotees oh okay the first thought that came in my mind was i think several years ago in one of the vrindavan temples they had dressed krishna in t-shirt and, uh, and jeans and that <laughs> That created an outrage and there was protest yeah. and then the Pujari was, I think Pujari had to leave or something like that. So <laughs> there, maybe there again also the, some limits might be required and time, according time, place, circumstance also. But Maharaj, your point is uh, significant that somehow the amount of reservations that we have with respect to using creativity in, in words that seems to be much more than with respect to music or graphic arts or architecture. Yeah. So is it because uh, the word is considered more, more authoritative or is it, is there any other reason for that? 
authoritative and also there's something very fixed about words in print. Um, and um, I mean, the, the ambivalent, the sense of ambivalence to the printed word or just the written word uh, in the West, it goes back to Plato, who, who wrote books. <laughs> but he, he expressed ambivalence, that once you write it down, it's fixed, uh, and whoever reads it, they're going to they're gonna misunderstand for sure. <laughs> and then within the uh, Vedic, and we can say uh, broader um, tradition from Veda, uh, there's also ambivalence. Um, the you know the Veda was not written down; it was heard and and memorized. And only when we get to Mahabharata, the epics, Mahabharata, Ramayana, and then the Puranas. And with the Puranas, it's also problematic because the mode of uh, communication of Purana, in particular, is oral. Uh, the, the Bhagavatam is telling of, you know, a layering of several oral uh, recitations and, and speaking of the Bhagavatam. And um, with each retelling, something changes, but it's understood it becomes more enriched if the person speaking is qualified. And that's the whole understanding of why do we have Bhagavatam classes? It's a retelling <laughs> of the Bhagavatam by the speaker. Um, so the written word has, in a sense, always been problematic. And um, I shouldn't say this, but... Uh, you know, we have quite an issue in our society about the editing of Srila Prabhupada's books. Yes. And I'm right in the midst of that because I'm part of a, a panel to review the editing. Um, and in, in a sense, I feel like this problem wouldn't be there if uh, we had just kept... Um, if we had just been able to keep at the time all the tape recordings of Srila Prabhupada, <laughs> because Prabhupada did not write books except for Bhagavad Gita and um, uh, Easy Journey to Other Planets. He didn't actually write books, he spoke. <laughs> and there's a world of difference. There's a world of difference between speaking and a written word. And we're struggling uh, with that gap. So you are saying that means if Prabhupada's audio recordings of his Bhagavatam purports and CC mm -hmm. purports, it would have been it might have been better if they had been kept like that rather than published as books at all. Uh, no, I'm not saying that because Prabhupada wanted books. <laughs> yeah. um, but I'm, I'm saying it would have been nice to have uh, as resources, if nothing else, for this process of editing. Um, uh, because uh, so I mean, many of them are multiple lost. issues. So many of Most them of them are lost. Oh. Most of them, because the way Prabhupada did it, he would record a tape, and these were these reel-to-reel -reel tapes. He would hand it to, say, His Holiness Sat Satsurup Das Goswami, who would then type the tape. Um, and then that uh, tape would go back to Srila Prabhupada, who would then record over what he had recorded previously, because they only had a handful of these tapes. My God, that's... The only tapes we have, original, are for Krishna book. Oh. Somehow for Krishna book, they were saved. Yeah, I, I've heard them also. Prabhupada says comma and full stop and Prabhupada's transcription. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, 
now so regarding the using of imagination so you said that in each retelling of the bhagavatam it becomes richer and that's why we also have bhagavatam classes so at uh, mm. you know with respect to retelling so there are times when prabhupad also uh, takes some creative license so for example prabhupad would say prabhupad would quote sarva dharma an prityajya and he says krishna is telling give up all your nonsense and just surrender right. to me <laughs> now <laughs> sarva dharma an prityajya and give up all your nonsense they are not really <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> so so in that sense yeah because yeah because he has the adi card to do that but he's also teaching us to develop adi card uh, for for preaching for uh represent for representing but also uh speaking of bhagavatam and prabhat's purports um now i haven't been able to find you know a recorded reference of this but um i believe it's his holiness bhakti vai baba swami who says that prabhat said once it's one of these prabhat said that um that eventually people will, re- will write purports to my purports devotees will write purports to my purports and what we're finding one of the things we're finding in this uh ed- editorial review process i find is this doesn't this becomes a necessity there are things that shila prabhupad writes where we we feel like we have to say wait a minute this needs some explanation <laughs> yeah this needs some this needs some elaboration this needs we don't want to change prabhupad's words but we want to give opportunity to understand <laughs> what uh we may feel is uh could easily be misunderstood so things like yes. that <laughs> i think that's a whole universe in itself because there are many yeah. statements that are very easily misunderstandable so um, yeah. maharaj is it going on to this retelling about say like uh, about the epics i have been writing a series of books on the ramayana and the mahabharata especially uh, maybe drawing oh. some practical lessons from these epics so it's more like human yeah. values and some spiritual values yeah so i have been looking at the spectrum of uh, literature that devotees have written and also uh, no, no, non devotees have written on the ramayana so yeah. i would like to talk about these yeah. levels and say of okay. using imagination so say now if i at one level the very translation requires some level of imagination say yes. now i i have the first mahabharata that i really read and could connect with was krishna dharma prabhu's his ramayana and mahabharata you know his he has a his writing has a power to bring like vivid visual imagery to the mind mm. and no. then i read a literal translation of the Mah- ramayana by say the kisari mohan ganguly who's mahabharata is there in the free dom- public domain so that stylized and that's almost archaic english so yes it, it's a struggle to read it to what to speak yeah. of uh, relish it so it's mm. one thing is just when we put when we say so that's also in english krishna dharma prose also in english but then yeah. it's more maybe say contemporary or more fluent a more natural english so the mm-hmm. words we choose to translate itself require some level of imagination yeah that's one thing and second thing is that quite often the atmosphere that is there that might be described to some extent but we might create some more of the atmosphere to transport the readers what is happening over there so when the coronation was happening there might be some description but we might create a little bit more of description so one is imagination and translation second is in the atmosphere then the third is in the in the uh dialogues so i see this most often done in dramas that quite often we could make the dialogues more 
whatever is given as a translation we could make it more punchy more memorable yeah. uh, more rhetorical yeah. whatever so many ways then there is also the inner thought processes quite often many of the at least the ramayana mahabharat many places they don't describe the inner thought processes yeah. and and this i find that as compared to a drama in a say a no, there is a dramatization and there is a novelization dramatization means like a depiction so novelization yeah. i find it actually better because we can see the thought process which is described so the, in the thought process mm. also there is some to tell the thought process there is some amount of uh, imagination then beyond that there are certain actions so that means the narrative itself is changed a little bit mm. so i find that when we go to the fifth level that's where the like the the red button starts uh, the red signal starts coming in very strongly that is somebody <laughs> yeah. is there is a popular indian author who has who tells who calls his series as rama stories or ramayan but then he says this is a complete work of fiction and he uses all the names of ram lakshman sita rao and everyone but it's completely different stories there's got nothing yeah. to do with the ramayan and now that that is something which is problematic but what do you think about the earlier four levels because they can actually bring the characters more to life for us yeah i personally have no problem with this and um what i see is it just affirms the greatness of the ramayana the fact that the ramayana becomes uh like a a reservoir a wellspring from which um elaboration enrichment and so on can come um there's a recently done uh ramayana by a young woman devotee in america mm. uh, vrinda yeah uh, vrinda devi do you know hers yeah i've seen it's, her yes. uh, three volumes yes <clears throat> i haven't seen the third volume but she's excellent writer uh and she's written on a level which is accessible uh for young people and uh she goes very much into she gives a lot of attention to character uh which i find very um uh, very relishable <laughs> yeah so so i i don't know i'm i'm i like to encourage that sort of thing uh of course there's a long tradition of this you mentioned with the ramayana specifically you probably know of the kamban ramayana yeah the tamil ramayana so um i i haven't read it directly i've read little excerpts but an example i read about of how he elaborates in the in the um valmiki ramayana the description of dasharatha traveling uh from ayodhya uh to mithila is two verses hmm. in in kamban ramayana it's i think it's over 100 verses i don't remember it's very long it's going into extensive detail about the scenery and what's going on like that yeah so and that's considered that's considered the just like in the north uh, it's the ram charit manas of tulsi das is more people are more familiar with that than with mm. the classic sanskrit valmiki ramayan similarly in the south i think they're more familiar with kamban kamban ramayan yeah so in a way it's a matter of uh time that um decides <laughs> what's going to be uh taken as as useful valuable and so on that's interesting yeah so it's a matter of time 
these are two good examples my ram uh, say ram charitmanas and kambarama and so now there is uh, there are three, three and they change speaking your your last point was about making some change in the story excuse me yeah um i know that um ram charitmanas uh as i remember he tulsi das completely eliminates um the banishment of sita uh, the punishment of sita and i forget what he does with the killing of bali but uh you know the things that are more difficult <laughs> he just he just goes around them yeah that's <laughs> you true. know it is so i also that the idea that ram accepts the berries that shabari has half eaten that is there in the ramcharitmanas but that's not in valmiki and right. also yeah. the lakshman rekha there's a lot of yeah yeah there's so, a lot of things like that yeah so is it just because say we could say hinduism or whatever term we want to use was such a uh, in it was geographically so widely spread that there was just no possibility for any central authority to be there that whoever wrote something and if it evoked a, it it uh, evoked rasa in people or it people found it acceptable then it became acceptable is it something like that overall ah uh, well yeah we could say the ge uh, geographical spread is one factor i think there are others um the fact that um the fact that yeah there's no it's not it's not like the abrahamic traditions um in so many ways <laughs> um you know there's the the whole idea of sampradaya is sometimes proverb would speak of the chain of the civic succession like you just have mm. one person after another but the other uh, image is in chaitanya charitamrita <coughs> of a tree a tree with branches and sub branches and when you get branches and sub branches and sub 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 branches uh you're going to get in the course of time different visions um so that would be part of it um that's that's also a big subject <laughs> yes ma'am <laughs> so interestingly what you said about different differences between these renditions sorry <coughs> excuse me so initially when i wrote my ram i started writing my ramayan articles like half of the article would be a, a description of the past time and the half would be the analysis and initially mm -hmm. just to avoid like imagining things i kept the whole past time in indirect speech mm -hmm. and then for one article i made a direct speech and it was almost like night and day the difference the whole past time came alive ah <coughs> so then several devotees told me that i should do it in direct speech and mm. then i started doing that so here you know what was done in the tradition it's very difficult to know why it was done and what were the limits but for us what we can do you now regarding the various ramayana i think there, just can i give some example can, sorry okay yeah you can, you can well i think a solution is very simple uh, and that is in your you have some kind of an introduction in which you say i'm taking certain liberties here and this is what i'm doing and this is why i'm doing it um and especially with ramayan you can say and also this is very much the tradition uh, uh i'm i'm not doing something new in that sense everybody does it <laughs> uh, i'm i'm not disrespecting uh valmiki ramayana but uh in order to highlight yeah in order to highlight rasa in order to bring out 
something. I am taking uh, some, I'm carefully taking some liberties. So you just say up front something like that. And then, okay, then the reader knows, okay, this is what, what I'm getting. Okay. Yes, Maharaj, I think that's, Krishna Dharma also does that in his book, and I also done that to some extent. Yeah. And now, just two examples of, say, Ramayans published by devotees. I won't use names over here, because we are all exploring. Yeah. So there's one devotee who did a Ramayana, in which, uh, when, say, Ravan, so when Dashrath is about to retire, at that time, to explain why he's retiring, Dashrath talks about the six anarthas. And Dashrath gives an exposition of how human life is ultimately meant to conquer all those anarthas. And now I ask this devotee, he, now there's no such description in the Ramayana that Dashrath gives a, like a monologue like that to anyone. But yeah. he said, you know, I am using the Ramayana to give a message. And I felt that's an appropriate place to give that message. But the problem mm -hmm. is that now devotees read that Ramayana and in the Vyasasan, they say, Dashrath says this, this, this. So, and then it becomes a slight problem. So when, <laughs> but then I suggest to the devotee that, you know, maybe wherever you have used something which is like a product of your imagination. I saw some Christian books on say some Christian saintly characters or something like that. They say they have a, they have a fact fiction index or fact imagination index where they say, mm -hmm. you know, this is from this source and this is a product of my imagination. But yeah. then this devotee said it will require too much work to do that. And now, just I'll complete this point. There's another devotee who did a Ramayana. And for doing that, uh, they portrayed as if in the Kaikai and the queens, they constantly used to have tensions and they were, they're quite quarrelsome. And the final uh, Ram being sent on exile, that was just a culmination of a long, long series of quarrels that were going on. Now, at mm. least from what I have seen in the Ramayana, and you know, we have, you would hear the stories of Ramayana when we were children. So usually the agency or the cause of the problem is more of Mantra's instigation, where she's also yeah. empowered by the Devtas. So to show that there's a long, a long history of quarrels among the queens and the queens were themselves quarrelsome. And that seems, it seems to go against the mood that we learned. Now from that devotee's yeah. perspective, that devotee said, I'm just giving a context to explain how such a big thing could happen. So, mm -hmm. but I found that uh, quite jarring to talk, hear about the quarrels. So now where do we, first of all, we don't have the authority to legislate because devotees are going to do what they're going to do. But at yes. least, <laughs> but at least some yeah. frames for thought, because I don't think any devotee would consciously want to do something which is which is objectionable or wrong. Every devotee, right. we can presume that they have good intentions, but if there is some discussion and then some guidelines can emerge and then devotees can decide how much they want to follow the guidelines. Broadly, any thoughts on this, Maharaj? Again, I would go back to a culture of review. I would say, uh, let someone who's written like the second example you've given, uh, if they're going to do that and they're justifying, well, you know, this calls for some context and so on. Okay, so then now I'm going to read this and, um, and I write my review in which I say, you know, I found this very jarring uh, because, and maybe you want to argue it's it's not necessary to have this. In fact, it spoils it for me because it was the whole um, focus on mantra, which you know made much more sense to me. But it does raise interesting questions, whatever, whatever. You can go on and on. Um, so the the reviewing culture, I think, is that's a form of regulation. Mm. Um, in which, again, you're educating uh, readers, educating authors, and creating a culture which is, let's say, constructively self-critical. 
and encouraging of, uh, of reflection. Uh, because, again, same example, um, part of me may want to react against uh, such an approach that the, that the wives were all, always <laughs> uh, arguing and so on. <clears throat> but, then, but then another side may say, well, there's a certain realism to that. Uh, which, I don't know, for whatever reason, one might argue could, could be justified. So, so that would be one thing, I think, this uh, a culture of, uh, of writing and review. And another point is that, back to the question, what is it about uh, the printed word that seems to <laughs> have some kind of special quality to it. Um, as authors, we have to be aware that we are always taking a risk because of the fact that there is this sense of uh, permanence to the printed word. Uh, someone is going to criticize. Someone is going to be not happy with what we write. <laughs> and maybe a lot of people are not going to be happy and we have to be ready for that. I mean, it doesn't matter what you write, especially the printed page. Now, of course, the internet, uh, you get instant response to some things. Um, but it's, it's part of the, the process, um, which, if we take it in the right way, can be um can can be nourishing uh, if criticism is given in the right spirit you know of you know genuinely wanting the best for everyone and it, if there's if there isn't false ego in the criticism it's constructive cr criticism mm -hmm. and of course uh any of us as writers we should want to have uh, mentors and you know this is of course can be a one role of of guru or it can be of a particular uh, another uh, colleague another devotee someone we can work with uh, who can be openly but constructively critical that can be very helpful yeah so you're saying it could work both ways that maybe the authors before publishing, they could get it reviewed or even if they get it mm. published, then if there are reviews available, then readers, when they're going to read it, they will be more discerning. And then maybe authors in future rounds of publishing will become more, more, more discerning also. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Even back to Godhead, I'm one of the editors. So uh. we discussed about publishing reviews of uh. books. So then our chief editor mentioned that if you are for a review to be a proper review, you can't just praise, you have to praise and criticize. And he says, we don't want to criticize yeah. devotees books. So yeah, this is part of our problem. <laughs> How do we do this? How do we do this in a proper Vaishnav within the scope of Vaishnav etiquette? Um, there is one uh, website. It's not, an ISKCON website, but uh, one of the Godia um, groups, uh, they have, I have to say, quite a nice website, and they're including uh, on their website uh, some book reviews, which are very nicely done. Uh, I don't remember if I've seen any fierce uh, criticism of anything there, but... Um, yeah, maybe back to God that is not the right place for it, but yeah. somewhere. <laughs> That's true. Yes, Maharaj. So, you know, I had talked with, uh, continuing this topic of imagination then. So, mm. if I understand right, uh, reviewing is the main thing that we could do at this stage and mentoring if it's there, that's even better. Yes. Mm. So now, going forward to 
the discussion on say like natak chandrika i think tamal krishna maharaj also wrote a book where he actually had like prabhupada antilila where he had that whole bhakti devi and runda devi and they were, how they were interacting while prabhupada's earthly pastimes were going on and you know this is in, in a almost a case of uh, we could say transcendental characters being depicted mm-hmm. doing something which is not really described in scripture so yeah. that is more for the sake of uh, building rasa that's what he writes in his book so that could be example yeah. of say using imagination Isn't yeah and uh, yes and take that example uh, of tamal krishna goswami's um prabhupad's final leela yeah. and and now let's imagine since we're talking about imagination <laughs> let's imagine a performance a performance a live performance of that drama uh with uh, these um we may say allegorical or otherwise uh, transcendental characters whatever hmm. um i suspect that we would very much appreciate we would simultaneously understand ah this has been you know this is the creativity of the the author um it's it's not in shastra and i suspect we would have, have no problem with it we would feel yes this is really good it it feels right it feels like it's uh, heightening the significance of 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 what is happening this great uh, devotee is preparing to depart from this world um i would think you know i would think anyone who objects to it um i would be looking you know like what is your problem <laughs> why why do you have a problem with it that's and, and i think shil prabhupad would would also appreciate or take um perhaps you've seen some of the performances of his holiness bhakti mark swami in my yeah poor very creative uh and and very yeah imaginative uh in in but in ways which um you really feel it draws out uh characters it draws out uh the drama it draws out the rasa and i i think this we want more of this prabhupad said um and i think we can find the reference for this if we looked um that uh how was it <clears throat> by cultural conquest this movement will spread he used that expression i think cultural conquest uh and i also also re- always remember uh one devotee who uh had been, been present in new york n- not at 26 2nd avenue but at the next temple it was henry street in um in the um new york area and uh he was saying that in those days they would every sunday feast they would have a short skit a short drama uh typically it was something based on something shila prabhupada had said in a lecture it would be the boatman and the professor or it would be the fish out of water you know something like that and i should turn this off um excuse me yeah these little skits you know or or some of the uh stories that bhakti siddhanta takur would tell to illustrate something about krishna consciousness and they would kind of throw together they wouldn't spend a lot of time to do it 
uh, to prepare, but they would put on this skit um, for the Sunday feast. And this devotee was saying the temple was packed every Sunday because this was the highlight <laughs> of the week. This was, uh, people loved it. And I've often said, um, I've often encouraged devotees, what often prevents us from doing these Sunday feast dramas is we think, oh, it takes too much time to prepare. But it doesn't have to take any time to prepare if we do it in the format of what's called a radio play in the West. A radio play means everybody is holding a script and reading from the script. You don't have to memorize anything. Okay. Then but you read dramatically. <laughs> and so maybe you act, act out. Okay. Maybe you act out some, some things. Uh, it depends what is, uh, what it, what it, particular thing is but you can you can make adjustments um, there can be a lot of improvisation uh, and and a lot of drama is very much about imagination because you're asking the uh, audience to imagine the scenery to imagine uh, so many things yeah you don't need costumes you don't need anything you need all you need is a script the parts maybe you have maybe you do one practice before you read through it so nobody's stumbling through the text and you maybe emphasize no when you sit, when this comes then you should really uh you know speak more forcefully like that that's interesting a lot of points there maharaj uh, firstly about uh, this cultural conquest which you mentioned and i have seen mm. there are two distinct readings of this within our yeah. movement one is that cultural conquest means that it's all over the world people will adopt indian or vedic culture and that's how we will conquer so and the other understanding is that uh, that the, through the bhakti culture as uh, presented in or rather bhakti being presented in culturally appealing ways will yeah. attract people and transform and they will they will be transformed so yeah that's that second one is my understanding oh okay because if you say we're going to get everybody uh, adopting indian culture um i mean good luck it's not happening <laughs> 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 That's true. You know, it's interesting that uh, it has seen some devotees feel that, say, the culture is in fact the biggest obstacle for people to come to Krishna. But then, yeah. usually, when we try to impose the culture on them, but mm. as a matter of curiosity, people are interested in the culture. See, yeah, some the curiosity. Yeah. But what you're talking about, cultural presentations, not so much like cultural imposition but more of right. presenting through culture. Yeah, and that makes historical sense also, because throughout India, the bhakti culture spread through the vernacularization of the tradition. And in a exactly. sense, that was the local, lo you could say, the various parts like the Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, Bengal, whichever, they took yeah. ownership of the culture and translated into their own language and depicted in their own ways. Exactly. That's, that's, and, and then it took root in the local culture. Mm -hmm. and this our, our movement is very much about spreading. We're spreading, spreading, spreading. And that's good. That's important. You know, every town and village. But once we get to a town and a village, we want it to also take root. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, it's going to be like tumbleweeds when the wind blows another something else culturally interesting comes along <laughs> then, then what happens <laughs> yeah, okay. and uh, so taking root uh, 
what do you think what all are required that people should feel express it in their own way or what all does taking root require it's it takes one thing it takes is uh, an openness to the existing culture and an appreciation of whatever is valuable in that culture um i think we make a mistake of course we know uh famously mahatma gandhi when he was asked in london what do you think of western civilization he said it would be a good idea <laughs> you know? yeah but you know okay that's a nice quip but there are aspects of western civilization which i wouldn't throw out with the bathwater um yeah i think uh, there's there's a lot there that is valuable and and if we look again historically the spread of um buddhism in china for example hmm. over centuries uh involved um integrating so much of what was the original buddhism and some of course will argue that it ended up being something completely different um okay but i would say there are recognizable aspects of buddhism chinese buddhism uh con connecting with earlier theravada buddhism um anyway that's just one example that there was some kind of integration some sort of responding uh to the local culture and again this took centuries it involved also huge uh challenges with regard to translation how do we translate uh these concepts into into chinese language so and that go comes back to the whole issue of editing prophet's books uh people are very i just want uh, to concern yeah before you go to that if i just you know this point about uh, taking good from the existing culture that's something which you know, i grew up in india and especially after we became after we started practicing krishna bhakti there was a culture of bashing western culture and that right. was a prominent part of our preaching also but yeah. after last last maybe last 5 6 years i have been traveling abroad and uh, you know I, it struck me in a major way that western culture is not a monolith and yeah. what what we call in the western culture also there was there is a religious or even a spiritual aspect to it for quite some time so mm. nowadays i try to speak more in terms of say materialistic culture and spiritual culture rather than indian and western so right. so this intolerance toward the uh, culture or mean intolerance or disrespect or dismissiveness uh, towards the culture which is there in which we seem to have quite a bit and that also leads to suppression or uh, neglect of cultural like contemporary cultural expressions uh, where do you think this comes from is it just our uh, like a new converts new uh, zeal neophyte enthusiasm because of which it came <laughs> or is it uh, what are your thoughts about that yeah um it's a kind of cultural chauvinism um <laughs> which i think in part at least and a very big part mm -hmm. is uh, a reaction and a very understandable reaction uh to uh the imperialist uh political uh and cultural situation in india um you know the dominance of of europe uh in india in the last 200 years especially uh there's now a big reaction to that and that's understandable but as i said it easily becomes throwing of throwing of babies out with bath water yeah. <laughs> and that's i think very unfortunate and has 
really the counter effect of what we want. Um, we want to spread Krishna consciousness. We don't want to spread um, Hindu. We don't, we're not, Prabhupada was not interested in Hinduism. Hmm. Um, he, he was interested in Krishna consciousness and he understood. And because he had such a clear understanding uh, of this distinction, I think because of this, he was successful uh, in his mission more than others who tried and failed. Despite the fact that he actually did bring so much of the, um, you know, cultural visual aspect with him, <laughs> yeah, more than so many of the others, he he brought with him uh, the dress and and the food and so on. Yeah, that's what I so was thinking when you said this that at a intellectual or ideological level. Prabhupada distanced himself from in, in Hinduism quite strongly. And yet Prabhupada, we could say, brought a very specific form of uh, Hindu culture. And we could say Bengali 19th century culture to the West. So, yeah. so, um, so you are saying that Prabhupada was successful because he, he didn't impose that or he was... He was able to adjust, or I mean, what, what, what? Because if he's bringing cultural specifics, then what, what is the point you're making exactly? Um, he, yes, he, as you said, he didn't impose anything. In fact, I remember when I first joined the devotees in Germany in 1972. Um, <laughs> I don't know how it became the practice, but it was the standard, speaking of dress, that all the men, brahmacharis, householders, we all were wearing uh, the uttariya of the sannyasi. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's interesting. Okay. Because Prabhupada was wearing it, we're also wearing it, so it was imitation. and. But my point is that he, I think he saw that. Whoops, you lost light now. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I should come back in a minute or two. <laughs> yeah. um, sorry. I think Prabhupada saw that, but he, ne he never said anything like, no, no, this is wrong. He, he just wanted to encourage everyone. Okay, you're going to imitate like this, whatever. <laughs> Of course, he was then, at some point, he became very strict on certain things, like, you know, the men should all have a shaved head and so on. I think also Prabhupada was uh, exploring what works, what doesn't work. And of course, in the very beginning, 26 Second Avenue, he wasn't telling anyone, shave your head. Oh. He just wanted to get everyone to chant Hare Krishna, to take prasadam. Mm. Um, yeah. So what am I saying? I'm not quite sure. <laughs> but uh, Prabhupada had, he was not a missionary for Hinduism. That I'm very, I'm very sure of. True. And I make that point in my book on uh, cow care. Yes. Is that he never said, uh, you know, Indian deshi cows are are the only cows and uh, the Western breeds are not really cows. He never said that. He wanted everyone uh, to, to do cow protection with whatever the local cows are. Mm. You know? So, That's... Uh, mm. so, mm. Just one or two last questions, Maharaj. I hope how much time yes. you have. Okay. Thank you. So now there is one genre which I have seen, uh, which is pop quite popular in Christianity. That is, they call it Christian fiction. And some of it is just mm -hmm. Christian people interacting and it's mostly centered on relationships and 
uh, how Christianity helps people to deal with life challenges. But they also have mm. Christian historical fiction where mm. they have imaginative retellings of the characters of, of the lives of Christian saints. And that keeps things mm. alive. So that means that makes those characters come alive for people today. So is there any mm -hmm. tradition of bhakti fiction that you are aware of? Within, of course, I don't think within ISKCON we have anything, but within the broader bhakti tradition or Gaudiya tradition, say... There's Jaiva Dharma, Bhaktivinoda Thakur's. Of course, that book is very much, um, it's a kind of presentation of what, Roman Catholic Christians would call the catechism, uh, yeah. but it's, it's done as, as a kind of narrative. Um, and then uh, this other sh shorter book of his, uh, what is it called? Prema, Prema Pradeep. Prema Pradeep, Prema Pradeep is yeah. done in, in a similar way. And I think he was inspired by um, Bankim Chandra Chatterjee. <laughs> Anand Mat or okay. Yeah, whatever, whatever yeah. it was. Um, okay. There was uh, many years ago. I don't remember the name. It was an Iskand devotee who wrote a novel, which I found very, very well done. Uh, it was called. What was it called? Uh, the. Uh, something like the life of the Vaishnav sages. And it was historic, it was historical novel. It was taking place sometime after uh, Lord Chaitanya. And it was something in South India. And I thought it was very well done. Uh, there's another book, and I don't remember the title of this, that's been done in German language some years ago. Uh, which goes back to mm, a few thousand years, like if I remember, it was a thousand years after the age of Kali begins, something like that. Yeah, I remember now. It was called Kali Kompt. Kali is coming. Okay. And I didn't read the whole thing. It was quite a long novel, but uh, also I found it very good. <laughs> mm. So... I don't know. I think anything we can do to... Uh, oh, and also we have one... <laughs> I like to tell... We have one devotee in Finland hmm. who writes... He's written at least 10 novels in Finnish language, so I can't tell you anything about the quality uh, or what the content, but he tells me uh, that he's weaving into these he he does different genres, sort of mystery, uh, adventure, historical novel, but he's always weaving in ideas um, of Christian consciousness. Yeah. And he he writes the novel, he publishes the novel himself. Okay. Sorry. And he go and he goes out on the street and sells the novel. <laughs> oh, that's very resourceful. Huh? So he's like, and in this way, he is maintaining his griha. <laughs> he's doing the whole thing himself. He's writing, publishing, <laughs> and going out and distributing <laughs> himself. <laughs> that's amazing. And actually, to maintain, yeah. a, maintain a livelihood through writing and is not easy unless one does really reasonably well through the books. Yeah, that's inspiring. Maharaj, with respect to bhakti fiction, I thought of three different categories again. One mm. is, say, we have non-historical characters and we have non-historical non storylines in which we bring in some bhakti, even bhakti philosophy. I think mm. nobody's going to object to that. But then, that's, that's, as long as the philosophy is reasonably accurately presented, that should be fine. And then other mm. is... We have non-historical characters in, say, historical settings. So mm. that means we create a character which, who say, is that present at the time of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu or at the time of Krishna and tell some things yeah. from his. So I think something similar to 
what you recommend in the swaran series and the third hmm. is say like we could say historical characters in non historical settings that means uh, hmm. we see there are some stories which are like that there is a story for example prabhupad says of a person tried to evade death and he covered himself with uh, human refuse excreta and then yamaraj came as a hog licked him clean and then took him away now whether actually yamaraj did like that and uh, you know it's it's open to question but there seems to be there are some stories of narad muni doing some funny things i heard a story once of a person who was chanting the name of who had no time to change chant the name of ram and then a saint told him look at his schedule he said you have no time okay so chant in the washroom and he was chanting in the washroom and hanuman heard the names being chanted hanuman came there and he got angry and hanuman went into the washroom and slapped this person on the face how dare you chant ram sacred name in the washroom and then hanuman went to ayodhya and met ram and ram was holding his face this is why are you holding this is it see the slap had gone on ram's face because he said i was in his bout and hanuman felt embarrassed now i don't know whether this story is given anywhere in the scripture so in some ways are all three you would say acceptable if they serve a right purpose yeah if they serve a purpose there i think they they all serve a purpose <laughs> <laughs> and and there will whether or not we like it there will be uh there, there will be these kind of uh expressions because there is this impulse uh to um it's it's our it's our human impulse something has to come out so i think this will be there whether or not someone likes it or not um and then then it's a matter of time what survives and how it survives and then you just uh okay. it it's time becomes the judge that's interesting yeah so time means enduring interest or it it has some enduring impact so people preserve it and follow it and pass it on yeah mm. yeah that's interesting from uh from again uh part pardon referring to the scholarly perspective but uh i once uh um took a course where the the subject was um was sacred scripture as this concept of being sacred what makes a scripture a scripture uh what makes it canonical what makes it authoritative so again it's the from the outside of the bottle but the basic idea was uh a scripture always belongs to a community take away the community and you no longer have a a a, a scripture you know no longer have um an authoritative text so it's it's always situated within a community oh so this is we could apply so, this for especially those which are not considered revelations in our tradition so whether they yeah. they may never become canonical but at least they may if they are accepted and if a community accepts them then they will continue mm, yeah yeah so rather than trying to legislate or police this like i like the way you explain the review you know i found it jarring rather than saying this is a deviation so yeah we present it from more from a perspective of uh, not a judgment about fidelity to tradition but of its effect on us then that would be yeah that's the best way to move forward rather than trying to legislate isn't it yeah yeah i think legislation is um in our modern world this is very problematic yeah <laughs> the less legislation the better <laughs> yes maharaj 
and in one sense that's how creativity will thrive otherwise if you're constantly looking over our shoulder yeah. otherwise we can't thrive yeah if if we want to have you know like soviet russia uh situation where the uh the creative impulses are you know very carefully controlled and if you write if you write the wrong thing you end up in prison you know <laughs> that's not going to work <laughs> that's that's a very uh you could say a very powerful load to to sort of uh I mean, conclude this uh, discussion on creativity. It's a very, mm. we, we, we don't want to legislate and if we can curb all artistic expression and Bhakti is actually flourished because of the artistic expressions of devotees throughout the generations. Yes, yes. And, you know, to get it back to, okay, am, am I saying kind of forget about tradition? No, I'm saying let's keep that Let's keep the direction of the guidance of Sadhu Shastra and Guru. We have those as our guides. Sadhu Shastra Guru Vakya, Hridoye Koryo Aikya. And, uh, but then when that uh, becomes an inspiration in the heart, how does that inspiration come out? Um, let, let it be expressed as genuinely coming from the heart and and then it becomes authentic kirtan and then it becomes authentic sankirtan and what we want is authenticity so you are saying authenticity is not necessarily say just just fidelity to the tradition but authenticity is in a sense the effect of the tradition on our heart, then expressed through us. Yes. Otherwise, if we're only um, if we're only becoming parrots of the tradition, then we're actually losing the tradition. The tradition becomes um, a, uh, an artifact, a museum artifact. A living tradition means. Uh, real people are experiencing, are renewing the tradition. You know, again, Srila Prabhupada, how many times he said, I'm simply repeating what my spiritual master said. But where will you find, you'll find very little in Srila Prabhupada's writing, which is word for word what Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Thakur wrote or said. Because Prabhupada is writing, speaking his own language, which is, that's what we want. We want his realized, you know, what is coming from his lotus mouth. <laughs> it's not just repetition, even though he says, I'm just repeating. In, a, in, a, in some sense, he is, and in an in important sense, he's not. He's not just repeating. So Prabhupada is using the word repeating in a somewhat different sense from what we might yeah. consider literal meaning of the word repeating. Yeah. yeah, he's obviously taking the message uh, and he's not compromising the message. So in that sense, he's certainly repeating. Uh, but it's not, it's not like a parrot. Yeah. Parroting will make us uh, simply like a museum artifact. That's, that's quite yeah. graphic also to think about it. Yes, well, and then you can put everything into some glass case, you know, and you can look at it from the outside and uh, you can have a label, and, you know, oh, this is what they were doing um, back in the early 21st century. Very interesting. What else is new? <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, there was what else is new. It just struck me that that goes with your point of renewing the tradition so yeah in a sense we Absolutely. we need to when we experience it and when you articulate it it's not just that we are when you use the word renew in what sense are you using it that it's a new expression or it's a new experience or a, what what do you mean by renewing 
Uh, it's, it's, um, or keeping alive simply. I think you... Prabhupada, I think Prabhupada used the expression old wine and new bottles. Yeah. Old, old, um, which is a, it's a Christian thing actually. Yeah. Um, that, um, renewal is, what is it exactly? There's, there's revival, uh, which Shila, which uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is doing, for example, when he sends uh, the Goswamis to Vrindavan. They're uh, excavating the, uh, the holy places of Vrindavan. So that's a kind of, it's a kind of uh, revival, you can say. Hmm. Uh, and then renewal, it may mean a lot of things. It can mean bringing in uh, uh, a, a new expression of language, a use of language. As you were saying, the whole bhakti tradition in India was established through vernacular languages. So that's a process of renewal, you can say. It's renewal and it's also an expansion uh, to reach uh, more people. Um, what else? I, I don't know. There can be so many aspects of renewal. But what I wanted to say is uh, the the getting back to holding on to tradition, the guru's duty is twofold. Uh, the duty, uh, the guru's duty is to uh, maintain tradition to represent tradition and simultaneously to innovate in order to make tradition uh, accessible to newer, to new audiences. Now the guru has to, has to be innovative, I would say. Yes. One way or another. I think Prabhupada says in the NOD lectures that this Krishna consciousness movement has been practically invented by me. And he says that in the context of if the spiritual master has to think of ways and means to get the disciples. Yes, to that's the Krishna. Thinking of ways and means. And on the other side, he would say, this is not stereotyped. It is not a stereotype process. Yeah. So this is a, so in a sense, if some devotees are culturally, say, using creativity, they're actually following the tradition. Although they might be giving some new expression, but they're in a sense following yeah. a very vibrant tradition. That's very reassuring and encouraging. Yeah, so, yeah well, uh, you know, you can look at the whole story of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's tra uh, preaching. Uh, it's, it's all, I think we could argue it's all um, he's being innovative. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. He uses different strategies at different places, meets with different yeah. people, talks in different ways. Yeah, that's quite yeah. a striking way of looking at it. Yes, Maharaj. Uh, can I sum try to summarize? And then if you have to... Okay. Words, yes, all right. So Maharaj, we discussed about the topic of using our imagination Krishna service and then you mentioned about the Krishna Smaranam devotees were blank but when you give an example of what were the thoughts of a of say the Brahman going from Rukmini to Krishna then that triggered the imagination and then we discussed even yeah, our yeah. tradition there is there is Gopal the Gopal Champu Anandavan Champu which has a distinctive shift especially in how Radharani's compassionate nature is being portrayed. And then there are dramas which are written yeah. according to very strict, uh, strict uh, uh, rules and uh, dramaturgy principles. And um, also you quoted that there is a, the Lord Chaitanya's led to a of expansion of literary expression. So being a Kavi is very much a part of our tradition. And uh, 
historically also bhakti has spread that way across india and there are various rama retellings uh, rama and retellings and the retellings are often more popular in north and south india than the sanskrit epic also and then we discussed about uh, boundaries so from chaitanya lila itself you said that saru damodar goswami is trying to uh, stopping something which had wrong siddhanta wrong rasa that could be seen as a representative of the reviewing process and rather than trying to legislate and decide which books can be published or not but if we could create a reviewing culture by which the authors become more discerning and then readers also become more dis discerning then that would be helpful and then there have been cultural there are already quite a diverse cultural creative cultural expressions in in art in uh, music in architecture and in words in writing because it's more authoritative more you could say uh, unchangeable or it's for forever there so there is more gravity and more concern about it and uh, we will we we will not be able to legislate it in today's age but if devotees also have mentors and they take feedback when they are doing this then we could continue this tradition cultural and actually this vital like dramas you said they are there is clear fiction but it is creativity which has a pleasing effect anyway the mahatma krishna maharaj's book so when prabhupad said culture cultural conquest will share krishna bhakti what that means is not that people will necessarily adopt a indian culture but through their contemporary cultural expressions of bhakti people will become attracted and that will require some respect for the existing culture and pre appropriate presentation accordingly and then lastly we talked about how tradition itself is the spiritual master has to have some amount of innovation to be so the renewal of the tradition means that there is experience of krishna and then there is a expression of krishna by the living individual so that's authenticity not just fidelity to tradition not just like a parrot like repetition but sharing one's own experience so and if we don't do that we will become like a museum piece but if we do that then our tradition will be renewed and will expanded any anything i missed out or any concluding words you like to say maharaj uh, that's a very nice summary if you like um i could now read uh this little piece that i wrote uh in this book yes, uh please. of krishna smarna shall i read it please please maharaj yes. it's about the brahman from vidarbha yes please <clears throat> a brahman has been dispatched by rukmini to dwaraka to inform lord krishna of her desire to marry him that's in brackets quote is it so is it true do i now enter the glorious city of gates dwaraka do i stand before the grand palace of lord krishna then why do i hesitate to enter am i not the brahmans am i not the brahman sent by my lady the glowing sapphire princess vidarbhi do i not carry her urgent message her call for help her plea for rescue her bid for marriage and why is it i i why is it i whom she has sent on this cru crucial mission was it fate that led me yesterday to join in the vedic chanting at her daily yag yagya was it planned from above that she would notice me sending her maid to fetch me to her private garden on the plea of an astrological reading from me and did i not hear patiently her missive of dangerous intent her detailed instruction how the lord of her life may give all opposition the slip and whisk her away and why is it i who finds himself here amidst the lord's eternal associates was it not the prediction of the astrologer at the time of my birth as my mother would always remind me years later that one day i would see lord krishna face to face and speak with him 
Have I not longed throughout my days to know when and how this would come about, imagining in every possible and impossible way the circumstances and the words I would speak? So why, at this long-awaited moment, do I hesitate? What holds me from approaching the guards? Indeed, what will I tell them? Would it be not right for me as a Brahmin to tell the truth? <clears throat> that I carry a message from my princess, the dark-eyed Vaidarbi? But would that not spoil everything, letting loose a flood of rumors that could reach too soon the ears of my lady's dreaded intended recipient of her hand, Shishupal? And upon finally seeing my lord, the sign azure of the Vrishnis, the full moon of Dwaraka, will I not be so dumbstruck that I will forget everything? who I am, where I am from, what is my purpose, and horror of horrors. If it is, as they say, that Lord Krishna honors the Brahmins, what if he honors this poor fellow right in front of his courtiers, even massaging my feet? Will I not be like a duck among swans, a jackal among lions, a meteor among the stars and moon? Should I hide my Brahman thread and come as a Vaisha or Shudra, saying some story to explain? But is this not foolishness to think Krishna will not know my identity? And for that matter, will he not also already know the content of the message I carry, being the all-knowing Lord of all? Then why indeed should I enter, simply making a disturbance when the Lord has more important matters to attend to? Oh, but what is happening now? Are these Dvarakavasis who pass me by as I stand hesitating, eyeing me curiously, wondering what is this strange Brahman? Will they not at any moment approach and ask me who I am, what it is I want? What will I tell them? And look, is it not the Abhijit Muhurta, the high noon moment of victory, the time to commence with important business? And does not Lord Krishna reassure, Ahang Tong Sarvapape Byo Moksha Shami Mahasucha? Is there anything other than foolishness that makes me hesitate? Then let me act now. Guards, do be so kind. I come from distant lands with a message for Lord Krishna, bringing him gladness and thus great joy to Dvaraka and the, the world. And then the guards speak and say, do be most welcome and enter. We happily bring you before our glorious Lord, the primeval supreme person, please enter. That's so vivid, so engaging. It's, you actually feel the, turmoil and the anxiety and the emotion in the heart of the Brahmin and few <laughs> things can actually absorb the heart in the pastime. Just narrating the pastime would not do this as much as uh, telling it from a first person narrative. Thank you Maharaj for sharing that. I think that beautifully mm -hmm. illustrates what is the purpose of using the imagination Krishna service to actually increase the remembrance mm -hmm. of Krishna, increase the attraction to Krishna, increase the emotional connect with Krishna's pastimes. Mm. Thank you. Is this available? Is this particular passage available online Maharaj somewhere or it's a part of the book? It's in the book. Uh, the book is available on okay. Kindle uh, for free, free download. Uh, if you search Krishna Smarana, yes. uh, you'll find. Yes. And um, and uh, also this Goris Marna. Now, if you search my name within Kindle, just Krishna Kshetra as two uh, words, K-R-I-S-H-N-A-K-S-H-E-T-R-A, you'll also find a couple of other books or three other books, uh, which I have written over the years. One is my one was my master's thesis. <laughs> That's the theology of Dita Gorsha. Uh, one is called From All Angles of Vision. Uh, so
and uh, another book is called In Praise of My Preceptor. Oh. See Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. It's just, uh, it's mainly some of my um, Vyasa Puja offerings over the years. And, uh, but also two or three, I, writ I wrote some sh short dramas on Srila Prabhupada's life. Those are included. Oh, okay. Thank you, Maharaj, for your time, your sharing your wisdom. And I hope that more and more devotees can relish your wisdom as well as your creativity in Krishna service. Thank you for your association. <laughs> Humble obeisances. It's been a Jai, Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai. Thank you, Maharaj. Humble obeisances. Hare Krishna. Ki Jai.